I'm Nicolas Bornels of Capital Link, and I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar. The topic of the webinar today is how the Ocean Shipping Reform Act will affect the global supply chain. This uh, uh, reform act uh, has been um, signed into law by President Biden on June 16, 2022. It is the first major US ocean shipping regulatory legislation in decades. Prompted by international supply chain issues, this legislation contains a number of provisions affecting common carriers in US international trade. This webinar will explore how this legislation will work in practice and what to expect in terms of changes affecting international carriers. We are delighted to have with us uh, a top level um, panelists. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Carl Benzel, Commissioner from the Federal Maritime Commission, Mr. John Butler, CEO and President of the World Shipping Council, and the discussion will be moderated by Mr. Charlie Papavisas, Chair for Maritime Practice at Winston & Strong. So thank you very much to um, all of you for attending. Thank you to our uh, panelists. And by the way, uh, in closing, I would like to say that uh, participants can submit questions using the Q&A function on their screen and uh, your questions will be uh, replied, answered uh, at the end of the discussion. And now I will turn the floor over to Charlie. And again, thank you very much to all three of you for joining us today. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for that introduction. Um, so yes, we're going to be talking about the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, which was, uh, as Nick said, uh, was only signed into law a uh, little more than a month ago. It's the, the act is a pretty good counterpoint to anyone who says no, nothing ever gets done in Congress, because it uh, was only introduced by Senator Cantwell in February. And it, 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 that's lightning speed, February to June. Now, mind you, of course, the, the, much of the bill uh, was germinating before. Ideas were floating around about what to do uh, with, the, with the change in worldwide demand that caused the supply chain issues. So the, it's, a little, it's a little bit uh, not accurate to say it all took, took place in four months. But that's still very fast. Um, it's left a lot to be done. The act um, touches many areas, but also puts a lot in Mr. Benzel and his uh, fellow commissioner's laps. So I, I'd like to start with each of the, the John and Carl will each give a few minutes uh, about whatever they wanna say about the state of affairs. And uh, we, we really do have two of the, two of the experts today um, uh, I'm sure they'll take questions from the audience at, at some point as you submit them, but let's get started and uh, get into the topic. So Carl, take it away. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Um, yeah, it's been a, a remarkable couple of years. I actually had an uh, opportunity to work on the legislation two decades ago, uh, well over two decades ago, uh, when Congress reformed uh, ocean shipping in, in 1998. Uh, and then uh, on this on this event, and I was actually at the White House at the signing ceremony. Uh, it was uh, there was a lot of interest uh, in ocean shipping, and I think uh, in particular there's uh, a, a growing recognition of the value of the essential services that are provided, and uh, and also an awareness of how it affects our economy uh, uh, so greatly, uh, and and uh, and I. Uh, you know, uh, inflationary costs are, are, are being uh, imposed in part by ocean shipping challenges and congestion. And I think you phrased it the right way. Uh, uh, this, this is a, a, a surge of cargo that has created uh, uh, the challenge that we, that we face. Uh, I think um, the latest statistics I saw were that there was a 26.9% increase in containerized imports in the United States from prior to the pandemic. And this is just a stunning amount of, of, of cargo uh, uh, that's being moved. Um, and so on one hand, we have to congratulate uh, the ocean carriers and the, the, the terminals and the, and the uh, truck drivers and the railroads uh, for achieving this, uh, but, but it more, more is needed uh, because that's the, that's the reality. And, and uh, with just-in-time uh, service uh, uh, delivery, it impacts every aspect 
of the economy. I'm, I'm, I'm stunned occasionally when I get uh, folks coming in and they tell me that uh, they import figs and I'm they're sort of uh, at a loss on how figs would uh, impact our, our uh, critical uh, infrastructure or uh, supply our, uh, to our people, but figs are used as a preservative and are used in many applications. And so uh, the connectivity and the need for ocean shipping services is very, uh, there's a depth to it that people don't understand uh, and how it affects our economy. So we, we at the FMC have begun to see the, uh, the dependency that our nation has on, on ocean, international ocean carriage, in particular the containerized uh, segment of that. And so, so when the pandemic uh, started, we really saw a surge of cargo um, in the immediate after effect of a depletion of cargo coming into the United States. So we went from about 20% down at most US ports to a swing where they were about 25% up uh, and there wasn't enough equipment, uh, there were not enough containers. And as things slowed down, the congestion caused additional uh, a loss to, uh, to the capacity in that market. And that was the driving factor that really resulted in the market uh, changes, uh, that, that structural change. And so uh, Congress, uh, as you said, stepped in and, and uh, revitalized uh, um, our statutory mandate uh, to, to increase our uh, responsibilities. And, I, and, and I'd say that the legislation itself is not a sea change. Really, it's a it's a it's an effort to provide more focus, uh, directs us to do look at uh, to different to different uh, requirements. Uh, but uh, uh, our function predominantly in regulating ocean shipping is to look at the practices of ocean carriers, marine terminals, and the uh, and the industry that provide services, and determine whether or not they're engaging in reasonable practices in the storing, handling, delivering, and receipt of cargo. And that includes cargo from uh, the intermodal segments that are uh, operating under a through bill of lading. And that standard, legal standard, really is uh, difficult to modify legislatively. Uh, what is reasonable is in the eye of the beholder. So as a commissioner, I may have a different view from my fellow commissioners on what is right and wrong, uh, but we work through those issues at the commission uh, and uh, my views are my own, and I work with uh, 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 four other commissioners to arrive at uh, policy changes. So we are we are looking uh, closely at uh, at the changes uh, that were uh, that were included in the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. I was at a meeting right before this with staff uh, going through what our plans are on implementation. Uh, but I think uh, the uh, two main changes are to, to require uh, more review of detention and demurrage uh, charges. Uh, a lot of these charges are aggravated by, uh, uh, by the congestion that's occurred. And, uh, and so evaluating uh, whether or not um, they are appropriate. Uh, there are some new self-executing language on requirements for ocean carriers and terminals. Uh, uh, and the industry to comply with uh, that uh, that mandate uh, certain uh, items and and the detention and demerge charges to be uh, made available to the public and process. Um, and so, and we're going to be taking further steps on that. Um, uh, and uh, a focus on enforcement, a greater level of enforcement. Um, traditionally, the market has been very competitive in ocean shipping. Uh, we are in a different situation. We have less carriers than we've had before. You know, we have nine major carriers. Uh, I think there's been uh, 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 16 mergers since 1997 uh, and uh, the loss of 31 ocean shipping companies. So it's a more concentrated market. Um, we, I, I feel that it's still competitive. Um, and, and so we'll continue to evaluate uh, ocean shipping agreements uh, that are filed with the agency to, to, to determine whether or not they are unfairly increasing uh, transportation uh, prices. And we, we, we monitor those agreements. Uh, and we uh, will be focusing on detention and demerge 
uh, malpractices, and then will be also uh, uh, synonymously uh, increasing personnel uh, for uh, investigations, for oversight uh, opportunities, uh, and providing more uh, consumer assistance uh, services going forward. So those are the three uh, the main changes, but it's not uh, structurally uh, something that would change uh, how we evaluate the industry per se. Uh, I, I, I say it's, it's really sharpening our focus on certain issues that were of concern, getting additional resources into our agency uh, to investigate affirmatively um, uh, and, uh, and working with the industry to uh, achieve compliance with new standards on uh, detention and demerge charges. So, um, so I, I, I think in, in some respects, it was a, a compromise between a more aggressive House bill uh, and, and the Senate, uh, and there was some discussion about that. And ultimately, they did pass that bill with a resounding, uh, overwhelming uh, level of support, both sides. There's really not a lot of difference uh, between the parties on ocean shipping reform. Um, and uh, whether I, or not it affects the marketplace, I, I will tell you, in my view, uh, supply and demand is the overriding uh, feature that uh, dictates uh, 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 ocean shipping and, and, and the uh, competition in, in that industry. Um, and, and I anticipate we'll have higher levels of demand uh, going forward uh, structurally as, a, as an economy. Uh, I, I think that we're still going to be at elevated levels. Uh, there are increasingly uh, efforts uh, are, uh, to, to diversify uh, the supply chain, but it's so dependent on just-in-time delivery for retail, for manufacturing, for, uh, I can't tell you how many times I have meetings where someone tells me that they're that a certain component is missing uh, and it's slowing down production. I was talking to home builders in Utah and they said that they had planned to build 205 residential, uh, 205,000 residential uh, units in Salt Lake City, uh, but had ended up building 140,000. And that was because they couldn't get a lot of the supplies they needed to finish those houses um, and those residential units. So it has uh, an incredible impact. But I, I do believe that it's, it's, the focus is, is really on the supply and the demand and the challenge of doing that. So um, it, it will be an interesting couple of years. We'll be expanding our operations. We're working with the industry. John's members have been, uh, I, I, de I dealt with all of the ocean carriers during the pandemic. They came in and they told me what they were trying to do and what they were uh, what their efforts were and where there were challenges. And those challenges were not just in ocean shipping. You know, if, we had, if we brought on more ships, more capacity, we'd still have the same challenges we have at US ports, uh, terminals, with railroad transportation, with equipment availability. So we have challenges that we'll have to address long-term uh, structurally uh, at, the, at the same time that we do whatever we do at the FMC. So uh, that's the uh, and I don't think there's a real silver bullet. Uh, I don't think this uh, act will change those dynamics, uh, macroeconomic uh, dynamics that uh, govern how the uh, industry is operating in the competitive uh, situation there. But uh, but we're we're doing things uh, in our agency uh, to uh, to enhance enforcement to, to ensure U.S. exporters are are uh, are getting a fair opportunity for common carriage. Uh, to, to ensure that they are, are seeing service uh, as well. Uh, and that is an area of concern we'll be looking at. And, uh, and then longer term, we're also evaluating whether or not we can um, uh, set up standards, long-term standards for data uh, use and information that should be provided to allow the industry throughout the supply chain to get better information and standardize uh, uh, that so that's where we are uh, at this point and and I'm going to turn it over to to you to turn it back to to John and I, uh, looking forward to hearing what he has to say and uh, and and then happy to answer any questions yeah thank you, you Carl I, I'm sure John's going to agree with literally everything you've just said <laughs> but I'll give him a chance to say that for himself <laughs> thanks Charlie uh, I agree with 85 percent of what the commissioner said. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, we can talk about the other 15 percent and in, in the rest of the hour. But, you know, a lot of what Commissioner Benzel said about sort of how we got here, why Congress got involved and then starting to look forward, you know, I do agree with. So we're, you know, we're two and a half years plus into the pandemic and we're every bit of two years into when really the first import surge hit the U.S. in terms of the increase in cargo volumes. Um, really, you know, that, that spike started in the summer of 2020 and it's never stopped, right? And so, you know, ocean carriers scrambled, um, moved a lot of capacity around, put a lot of capacity into Trans-Pacific because that's where we really saw the heat uh, at the beginning. Um, and that investment in, in, in capacity and in, in containers and, and ships for the future continues. I mean, uh, carriers are doing everything they can to put enough capacity on the water to handle the situation. As Commissioner Benson pointed out, though, the real driver of the congestion, frankly, is on land. Uh, we still have, and not just in the United States, but in places all over the world, we've got ships backed up waiting for a berth at port. And that tells you that there's something going on on the land side um, that prevents those ships from coming in. And again, here in the United States, we've seen either all at once or at different times, we've seen issues with, with trucking capacity. Right now, you know, a lot of focus on, on rail off the West Coast in particular. Uh, and through the, throughout the entire pandemic, we've seen warehouses full. And so even if you've got the truck and the rail capacity, there's no place to, to put it when it gets to its final destination. And of course, that, that holds up containers, it slows down fluidity, and all of that gets pushed back to the ports and onto the ocean. And that's where we see the, you know, the manifestation of that. So that's kind of the, the background of why people, you know, in the Congress got engaged. Um, I think what's interesting to point out, and I think Commissioner Benzel said that, I think he would agree that, you know, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of, of 2022 is not designed to fix all those inland problems. It doesn't even touch them doesn't even attempt to. And indeed, it doesn't even try to address every aspect of, you know, ocean carriage. It is, as the commissioner described, you know, it's more evolutionary than revolutionary. And it focuses on a couple of important uh, aspects of the relationship between carriers and shippers primarily. Um, and so the bill wasn't designed to, and it can't, change the macroeconomic forces that we're dealing with on a global basis. That's just not, not possible. Um, and nobody expects it to. Um, but that's not to say that it's not important. It's not to say that there's not a lot of work that needs to be done to implement it. And uh, I'll, I'll leave uh, maybe the details of that for a further discussion because Charlie, I know you wanna get into some of the particulars. Thanks. No, oh, thanks, John. So Carl, you mentioned that you're going to be rolling things out. Can you give a little more color on that timing, what you're sure. rolling out first, uh, you know, where you're, where you're putting your emphasis? Well, we're, uh, <clears throat> sorry, Charlie. Uh, um, we're, uh, we're, I had a briefing today uh, with our staff uh, about you know, next steps. Uh, we'll be having a public meeting tomorrow, open meeting. So anyone can go to the uh, www. Uh, dot fmc dot gov and see the opening uh, 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 briefings uh, from our staff. Uh, we've sort of uh, categorized the areas of legislative uh, and regulatory change going forward, um, and uh, uh, we've we've started the process of identifying resources. Uh, we we are resource uh, strained uh, right now. Uh, FMC has 118 people working here uh, for. Uh, I'd say uh, $1.5 trillion of, cargo, of containerized cargo being imported into the United States. Uh, another probably $3.5 trillion of affiliated intermodal uh, services and, and uh, activity, activity uh, economic activity uh, for that uh, $6 trillion, uh, maybe it's $4.5 trillion of, of, of affiliated uh, uh, 
uh, economic activity. Uh, for that, we have six investigators na uh, uh, nationally, and so, so that's Carl, about. Carl, you need to you need to hire some outside law firms to help we, you. I we uh, we need to to, we may try to hire your uh, your your colleagues and <laughs> lower level colleagues, uh, but I don't know if we can compete. Uh, but yeah, it's just a uh, one uh, investigator for every trillion dollars of commerce that we have. Uh, by way of comparison, the uh, SEC has about 150 investigators for every trillion dollars of uh, financial instruments and securities that they regulate. So, uh, so we're uh, we're we're actually resorting to rehiring people uh, that that worked here uh, to get going on it. But we are, are focusing on enforcement and and enhancements to enforcement. Uh, activities related to uh, detention and demurrage will be up first. Uh, so I expect that we'll be doing uh, rulemaking in the near future. It's already underway. Uh, we've solicited comments uh, and there are, um, there are already self-executing requ requirements on uh, certain things that need to be done for detention and demurrage. And so uh, that will be on the uh, immediate horizon. Um, and so we're uh, we're we're planning each segment of of uh, of time, but um, you know, we, on on issuing regulations, it just takes some time to get through the process of commenting and evaluating the comments and and responding to the comments. And so uh, we probably have five or six major rulemakings uh, that will be starting uh, in short uh, in short term, and uh, and very few people to do. Uh, to do the work, so uh, we're wrestling with that, and so I think we're we're trying to uh, prior. We'll have to prioritize uh, how we go through the legislation, uh, but but uh, but it's it's uh, it's being uh, undertaken. Uh, again, the first meeting, uh, public meeting, will be uh, tomorrow, um, and uh, and uh, we'll do whatever we need to do to get it done. So, John, what, uh, where do you, where do you think the commission should, should focus? I mean, what, what do your members believe is the place that they would like a little more clarity, some certainty? Well, uh, you know, the Congress gave a list to the FMC and said, you know, here's here's three rulemakings you need to do, and so, uh, in a sense, that that discussion's over. Um, I do think that the uh, you know the commission was was a head of the game on detention and demurrage. Uh, already had an advance notice of proposed rulemaking out and comments in on that before OSPRA was even passed. So I do see that as an area where, frankly, I think it, it's been a, a source of tension um, between carriers and customers um, in one form or another for a long time. And I I do think that some clear rules of the road there will, will make a difference in improving that relationship. I think it's critical as we do those rulemakings to keep in mind that detention and demurrage exist for a reason. Um, you know, first and foremost, to keep cargo moving and, and we certainly need to do that right now, but it's also a, it's, it's a risk allocation measure as well. So, you know, we're gonna look for, um, for a balanced rulemaking there. Uh, but that, I think that'll go a long way to reducing some of the some of the deten some of the tension rather um, uh, amongst commercial players. And beyond that, you know, we'll have to see which way the commission goes with some of these other rulemakings. Uh, you know, they get the they get to make the first draft, and we have to respond to that. So a little hard to get into details on that, but. As a general matter, you know, what we look for from a rulemaking, you know, several things. Uh, you want a fair and transparent process that follows what the Congress said in the law, right? The, the agency uh, is, is duty bound to do that. Um, and we, we need outcomes also that support good commercial and operational solutions. And, and Commissioner Bensel said earlier, you know, the, the, the market's going to continue to drive this industry, and that's how it should be. So we need to take into account the realities of the business, the operational realities, so that we don't, uh, through the rulemaking process, make things worse rather than better. Um, and part of doing that is setting some, you know, some guardrails so everybody knows what the boundaries are. It gets to this point that the commissioner made about having to define reasonableness 
in, in a lot of different situations. And I would, I wouldn't disagree as a sort of a general matter that reasonableness may be in the eye of the beholder, but uh, the fact of the matter is it's the job of the commission um, to come up with an objective description of what reasonableness is. Otherwise we get more fights, not fewer fights. And what we wanna do is reduce conflict and, and put our energy into moving cargo. John, do you, do you agree that this is almost an impossible task for the commission in the sense that demerged and detention, as you say, are set uh, by the market, so to speak, and it's sort of the symptom, not the cause of the issues? And therefore, attacking the symptom doesn't, what, what, what can you do with the symptom? You have to go to the cause, which is more throughput. What do you think about that? Well, you have to do both. And look, there's, you know, the, the Congress has, has spoken and said, you know, essentially can, to the commission, continue your work on detention and demerge. And as I said a moment ago, I think there are, there are things the commission can productively do to give all parties a little better sense of what the expectations are. Uh, a lot of the frustration that I've heard, frankly, over the years from shippers um, has been lack of communication. And I know our members are trying uh, to remedy that quite aside from the rulemakings, but that's the direction that Congress took with the self-executing provisions in, in OSRA. That's the direction that the commission has taken in its, in its first uh, ANPRM is to say, look, what's the information that the marine terminal operator or the carrier has to give to the person who's being asked to pay that bill? And I think that even by itself is gonna go a long way toward reducing some of the friction in the system. So I do think that that can be done. What I think we need to guard against is, is what you say is, you know, pretending that somehow, you know, putting a big lever on a very small piece of the, of the supply chain and pretending that it's going to fix everything. Uh, that's not realistic. It's not possible. So we have to be realistic in our expectations and, you know, look ourselves in the mirror and be honest about what you can do with the tools you've got. Carl, you want you want to react to that? I mean, what do you what do you think? Can you can you really attack the problem, the throughput throughput problem, by focusing on demerge and detention? No, I, I think it's more a more a symptom of of the problem uh, these uh, these issues. But we're we're looking at other things. Uh, the Maritime Transportation Data Initiative, the information. There's not a lot of room at U.S. ports. I mean, these are ports that have been here for hundreds of years. That cities have grown up around them, and so uh, uh, efficiency of movement through the system um, in the United States is probably key to, to getting uh, better better uh, uh, throughput, better uh, results, uh, and coordination. Uh, <clears throat> the industry has many many different actors out there, and it's it's a huge industry, really, when you get down to it. Uh, and uh, and the ocean carriers are intermodal carriers. Uh, uh, they 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 want to provide that service, and so they've got to work with a number of players uh, that are are their partners in the movement of cargo. And um, in, in my view, we we still have a lot of disconnect. You know, there's not enough information that's it's not ca characterized the same way by different players. It's not made available to all aspects of of the of the maritime and transportation community. We have warehouses that are not telling people when they're closed and open. Uh, we have a lot of discussion, for instance, of 24-hour uh, uh, seven uh, operations in, in U.S. ports. But you have to have multiple players doing that. If you don't, it doesn't matter. Uh, no one's going to sit there and wait uh, with cargo for six hours in a truck until a, a distribution center opens its gates. So there's there's got to be a better um, but the volumes are, are huge that, we're, that, that you, you go into these ports. And so we're going to have to rethink how we do um, operational intermodal. And I agree with John's uh, comment uh, completely that this is a, a real major challenge, not, not on the ocean side. Cargo is getting here. Uh, it's how do we get it through the system? And the system is more complex in the United States 
than anywhere else. We use 53 foot containers, 45 foot containers. We have distribution hubs. We have transload facilities. We have, uh, you know, the, the operations of terminal operations are completely different uh, uh, from the, the uh, maritime operations and, and coordinating uh, drainage uh, is, is difficult. They have equipment here, uh, chassis, and you also have uh, truck uh, companies that have to get access to that. And so it's very uh, complex system. So long term, I think uh, coordination will allow us uh, greater coordination on, on, on information will allow us to do better and wring out a little bit more efficiency at a really congested tight entry point. Uh, when I started working, uh, Charlie, you and I have worked together for many, many years in this, this industry. Uh, uh, you know, the port of uh, Savannah uh, was less than a half million uh, uh, containers, TEUs a year. Now they're 8 million TEUs this year. And so, uh, and there's 35 ships offshore. Uh, two years ago, there was no ships waiting for birth space in the United States. And we've been averaging between 100 and 150 ships waiting to get in, sometimes up to two weeks. And uh, again, a function of uh, supply and demand, but also challenges of moving that uh, a commodity through a really uh, congested landside uh, environment. Uh, and, uh, and the carriers have bigger and bigger ships and, and, and that creates uh, its own uh, challenges on shore side. So I, I think the name of the game is in the future, uh, how, how can we make that uh, system more efficient and, uh, and foster that? And in part, a large part, that's gonna be the industry uh, because they, they work together as, as, uh, as partners. And so when rail goes down at a port uh, and slows down, it slows down everything behind it. And that's the same uh, with trucking you know, if trucking slows down. So anyways, uh, detention and demurrage is a symptom of, of the problems of congestion. John, let me ask you a question um, about the looming recession in many countries. Is the, is, the, is the recessions that may occur in Europe, in the United States, elsewhere, is this, is this gonna solve the problems that the act was intended to fix? In other words, are we just, is it just going to result in lower, uh, lowering of demand sufficient that a lot of the congestion will go away? Now, first thing I'd say, Charlie, is uh, I don't think the act was designed to fix congestion. <laughs> you know, it just wasn't. And, 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 and notwithstanding a lot of the, the rhetoric around it from a few people, you know, if you listen to the floor statements that were made, you know, when, when the the bill went through the house on, on, on the consent calendar. A lot of people stood up and said, look, I'm going to vote for this. I know it's not going to fix congestion, but it, it's going to help with some of these particular things. And so I think we need to start there that we shouldn't say, you know, pitch or, or you know, pitch OSPR versus the market. I mean, OSPR is designed to do some very, very specific things. And as we've discussed here this morning, I think it'll do some of those things. The market will be driven by supply and demand. And so as we see inflationary pressures, as we see the possibility of, of recession, um, you can only think that that's going to reduce the demand and that will help things to, to get back into whack. So, um, you know, and that's always been the case. No market like this lasts forever. You know, we, and we, we, we said that at the beginning when we saw these really unusual market conditions, we said, this is driven by the market. The solutions are gonna come by the, from the market. That's still the case, um, but it's not gonna happen overnight. There's a lot of unwinding. There's a lot of, as Commissioner Bensel said, there's an awful lot of cargo stuck inland, in the, not just in the United States, but in other places. Europe is having some tremendous problems in that regard. So um, that's gonna take, a while for that lump to work through the snake. But I think, you know, we're going to get there and we're closer to that than we were two years ago. That's for sure. So okay. I'm going to take a Charlie, ahead, uh, Charlie. So there's a lot of discussion about recession, but when you talk to the ocean shipping companies about their volumes, they're not telling me about any recession. And so I've been shocked, frankly, at the uh, behavior of U.S. consumers and continuing to uh, we're having record 
June, June and July. So, so uh, with, as John said, recession maybe, but I don't see it right now. Uh, I see just a, you know continuation of, of volumes through the, of the through the balance of this year. It's probably going to get worse uh, uh, as as we ramp up for traditional high volume seasons. Uh, so, but anyways, uh, I'm a little. It's tough to say that pe uh, pe uh, we're going to have a recession when people keep on buying. I understood, um, and some of it depends on the gas pipeline in Europe and so on. So. Yeah. Uh, I want to take some of the questions that have been submitted, and I'll take maybe one of the ones that's a little provocative, uh, and it goes as follows. The rhetoric from President Biden seems to contradict FMC, i.e. he thinks carriers colluded to raise freight rates. Who is right? Uh, that's, that's, that's a jump ball, so either of you could take that one. Well, that's an easy one. The <laughs> FMC is right. Well, uh, so, uh, you know, we, we look closely. Uh, th there's three major alliances that are, uh, are, are the major carriers are engaged in. There are space sharing arrangements. Uh, so by virtue of being sharing space on each other's ships and not uh, providing information on pricing, uh, if they buy by that, uh, you're getting more competitive alternatives for, for consumers, um, you know, if you want to look, in my view, at what uh, what has increased concentration, it's not the alliances per se, because we have uh, we're looking at them uh, on a monthly basis, and the carriers uh, cooperate. Uh, but we did have a, a, a number of mergers, as I said, we had uh, 16 mergers since 1997, and that was 31 companies, and I don't think the Justice Department looked at one of them. Uh, and so, uh, so I don't uh, agree that there is collusion uh, that is uh, that is uh, driving the current uh, challenges. It's easy to 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 point uh, a finger here, but uh, but there's frustration with the market, and I would say that that uh, deserves attention, and that's why we're 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 looking at that. So, John, uh, let me turn to a question that, that's directed to you about a potential shipper's bill of rights. Uh, I guess there's been discussion in the industry about whether such a thing would be useful. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think your members think about that? Um, you you kind of have to see the animal before you can respond to what you think of it. But um, I, I think a couple of things. Um, first of all, there are any number of provisions, and prohibitions specifically uh, on unreasonable behavior in the Shipping Act. So there's already a, a shipper's bill of rights. It's, it's called the Shipping Act. Um, and secondly, you know, when you get down to dealing with individual situations, that is, it always has been, and it has to be a matter of commercial negotiation between the shipper and the carrier. Um, you know, I spoke earlier of the need and the importance of having some some guardrails in regulation. And of course, that comes from the Shipping Act and the FMC's regulations. But when you start trying to dictate how a particular situation is handled through a set of rules, it ends up either being useless or it ends up being a problem by itself because you're trying to put a bunch of square pegs into round holes. So, you know. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what that, that thing would look like, but frankly, I think it already exists. Yeah, and if it was, and if it expressed rights, of course, it could lead to, to that, that being used in litigation, could it not? Well, I mean, you know, I don't know if we're talking about writing something on the wall or if we're talking about a regulation, obviously something that doesn't have the force of law, you know, can't create rights. And I guess that's the other thing. I think we should put our, our energy into fixing the supply chain problems. And, you know, to your point from earlier, not pretending that we've fixed the problem when all we've done is, is rail about the, the symptom. Right. So Carl, I'm gonna throw one at you from the audience. Uh, are there any concerns that prior to the commission providing additional guidance that the confusion about what is reasonable will exacerbate congestion? Well, I think that's our objective: is to uh, eliminate uh, confusion, uh, to provi provide provide uh, 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 standards that are are commercially attainable, but also uh, define the rights and responsibilities of both parties. So, 
So I think uh, uh, why we're in this position is there was a lot of room. Uh, we've enunciated already what is the incentive pr principle that is uh, detention and demerge is intended uh, to uh, provide fluidity in the movement of cargo and the receipt of cargo um, and the industry <clears throat> sometimes has uh, you, uh, used uh, those uh, standards for fluidity um, uh, uh, inappropriately uh, to, to assess penalties. Um, and, and other cases, uh, and, and I think John pointed this out, that those same requirements sometimes shippers use to avoid, uh, uh, to, to, to take advantage of uh, that reduced fluidity. So, so both sides have to uh, abide by uh, sort of uh, principles on, on, on how to handle uh, detention and demerge. But it, uh, John's right. There are uh, cases where shippers are keeping their cargo in uh, marine terminals uh, for storage. And, uh, and these are not storage uh, facilities. They are, uh, they, are, they are marine terminals and they're intended to be fluid. Uh, so so uh, it's both sides, but I think that there's a lot of room for uh, for coming up with uh, some standards uh, to govern how what's a, a reasonable way uh, to conduct business. And I think we have to take a step right now. And and frankly, I would say if if we hadn't had congestion uh, to the levels that we have right now, we probably wouldn't be in this boat. But we are, and so so uh, so we're going to uh, move forward with establishing a reasonable standards. Congress told us certain things that they wanted to do. We're gonna be looking at other things and uh, hopefully they're clear, they're easy to follow and, and there's gonna be some adjustment. They, the industry, you know, they've told us already, you know, even with the self-executing requirements of detention and demerge that it's gonna take us some time to set up our systems uh, and programs uh, to, to do this. So. Uh, we'll we'll work with that, but the the intent is to set firm uh, guidelines that are achievable commercially, uh, but but avoid these situations where uh, it's been abused. John, did you want to comment on that also uh, about uh, whether the problems will be exacerbated or not? No, I think I, I think the way you could exacerbate the problem is, is by going, you know, swinging the pendulum too far in one direction or the other in terms of, of, of balancing the rights and obligations of all the parties. I think we need to come at this not with a little bit of, you know, there's been a bit of a punitive mindset that, that animated some of what happened in the Congress. Um, that's part of the political process that's to be expected. Um, the Congress had the wisdom to say to the FMC, okay, we've told you what, what needs to be worked on. The Congress had the wisdom to say to the FMC, work out the details. And it's in working out those details that I think the, the commission has a really important role to, to strike that balance. Because if, you know, there were, there were shipper groups uh, early on in the pandemic that wrote to the FMC and said, wipe out detention and demerge for the duration, right? Uh, you think we had congestion before, right? So, you know, that's that's the pendulum swinging a long way in one direction. Of course, the FMC didn't have the authority and nor did it have any inclination to do that for good reason. But that's one extreme. The other extreme is anything goes. That doesn't work. But we have to keep in mind that the the purpose of these regulations is twofold. First and foremost, we need to set up a situation, a regulatory situation where the industry can operate efficiently and keep cargo moving. Because as the commissioner said, if you've got fluidity, you don't have delays, you don't have detention and demerge. So that's number one. Number two, you're always going to have some level of disagreement and conflict. And so you have to have standards that are fair to both parties when those disputes do arise. And those are the two things. You know, the commission has been through this before with any number of, of different rulemakings, and, and that's what the commission's job is. So, you know, we're confident that um, with the right input from the industry and uh, a level head, the commission will come up with something that makes sense for everybody. We've reached about the end of our time. I'd like to take more questions from the audience, but unfortunately, time will not permit. Uh, I'd like to give you each an opportunity to close, and I'd like you to focus on one thing in particular, 
which is we're expecting a potential political makeup of Congress to change considerably next year. Will this Ocean Shipping Reform Act be revisited soon or at some time in the next couple of years? And then otherwise, however you want to close would be great. Carl, let's go with you. Well, you know, I, I really don't see uh, major uh, issues between the parties on ocean shipping. Uh, both both sides were very uh, supportive of of uh, of uh, of doing something here. I mean, the market has changed. When I started working on ocean shipping issues, there was a pretty strong U.S. flag presence that is not there as much uh, anymore, and uh, and so. Uh, so they tend to uh, be a little bit uh, more re reactive in response to issues that U.S. shippers pose. That's the that's the makeup. Um, so uh, there's a lot of large square states in the middle of the country that are uh, are, are more red than blue, and and so that uh, impacts how the, the the makeup of Congress perceives things. And and really, I don't see um, uh, much of a difference between uh, commissioners. Uh, uh, we're we're all, we're all trying to make the system work better to work with the industry uh, to make sure that they can uh, they can provide the service that we need. Um, and so I really uh, I don't think it affects uh, what we're doing here uh, at the FMC uh, one way or the other. It may make changes in, in other areas. Uh, they passed an infrastructure bill. Uh, you know that that'll have some impact going forward. But as I said, our Ports are incredibly congested and they're in big urban areas and building through this problem is a challenge. So uh, long term, maybe we can coordinate uh, uh, between the modes uh, better and, and set up and facilitate that. Uh, but I don't really think that um, pol politics will get uh, in, in, into this uh, as much in terms of the regulatory issues that would govern the industry. Uh, uh, our standard is, you know, is what is reasonable, and that's uh, that's a matter of looking at the practices that are engaged in and seeing if they're if they're if they're not unfair and they're not hurting the, the shipping public, and they're facilitating the movement of cargo. So, politics, I don't think, uh, you know, I've, I could be wrong, but I but I have a tendency to think uh, right here is more an issue of maritime policy and shipping policy and and you're a maritime lawyer, and you'd like to hear that, but uh, but I think that's uh, pretty much what's what's uh, what the situation is. John, and any closing comments? Yeah, I, I think in answer to your question about you know does Congress come back and revisit this next year after the after the elections? I mean, the Congress, um, not just with this topic, but with most topics. It, 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 it makes its will known. Um, in this case, it's handed the direction to the FMC. The Congress knows it takes time to make those policies and have them come into effect. And then you, you evaluate what comes out of that. So I don't see Congress, you know, going back and forth on this thing in some sort of whipsaw. I just don't see that happening. And um, beyond that, it really is a function, frankly, for a lot of, you know, Commissioner started this way, and I'll end this way. One of the one of the silver linings of the problems we've had, the attention that it's gotten, both in the Congress and in the media worldwide, is that people understand now where their stuff comes from, right? Or anybody who's paying attention does, and I think that's critically important. Uh, we haven't always had that. One of the things that I think we all have to ask ourselves is. What is the system that we want to have going forward? And are we, as a society, as carrier shippers, warehousemen, are we willing to pay for a system that can handle any surge, no matter how huge and how protracted? And I think we've already seen the answer to some extent. Uh, you know, investment in warehouses has already peaked and gone back down. Um, you know, you don't build the church for, for Easter. Um, and so as we have this policy debate, people have to look in the mirror and say, what do I really need and what am I willing to pay for? And I think that's something we need to keep front of mind as we as we go forward. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you, Carl. I, I thought this was a great session. I know we could go on easily for another 45 minutes. 
but the organizers have only given us this amount of time and we want to respect that as well as our audience thank you very much for participating today and thank you again everybody in the audience thank you enjoyed it